She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me The way she grabs me and intoxicates Until the signal's in my mind Forget to operate Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another Coffee and Crime Time. On Monday, May 1st, 2023, the Oklahoma Highway Patrol sent out Amber Alerts for two Henrietta teenagers, 14-year-old Ivy Webster and 15-year-old Brittany Brewer. Brittany's father told the police that his daughter had spent the night with a friend, but she hadn't returned home on Sunday night as planned. And Ivy's parents were experiencing the same thing. On that same Monday morning, the local sheriff's office, with an arrest warrant in hand, arrived at the home of 39-year-old Jesse McFadden, a registered sex offender who had failed to show up to court that morning. The horrifying discoveries they made on that property and inside that house would answer the questions of where Brittany and Ivy were and why Jesse McFadden had missed his court date. Now, this is a case that's been developing since early last month, and I've been following it since the day it happened, because honestly, this is one of my greatest fears. At first, there was very little information, so I didn't talk about it with you all, even though it was very requested and people wanted me to, because I knew there was more to this story. I knew that there was going to be lessons to be learned, and as it turns out, I was right on both fronts. There is, of course, still more to learn, but today we're going to talk about what we know so far. This is a hard one, but very, 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 very important for multiple reasons. Just take my word for it. And if at the end of the video you're like, you lie, there aren't important lessons to be learned here. This wasn't important. This was just traumatic. Then, you know, let me know in the comments. But trust me, this is this is something that we all need to hear. Also, I have been getting a lot of requests to cover the Natalia Barnett case now that it has been adjudicated, gone through the court system. Oh, I'm going to. I'm going to. I just watched the documentary series last night. Um, so I'm recording this on June 2nd, I believe. And I watched the entire series last night. I stayed up very late. I could not stop watching it. And I now understand what people mean when they say my blood was boiling because my blood was boiling. Oh, my God. The first couple of episodes, I was like, okay, well, this doesn't seem too bad. And then, oh, it got it got bad, and then it, got, it kept getting worse. So, oh, I'm going to talk about this. I'm going to talk about what happened to Natalia. And let me also say that I have never in my life, and I've watched a lot of documentary films and a lot of documentary series, I've never in my life watched a documentary where almost every single person that opened their mouth was a horrible person. Um, you know, even Tiger King. Tiger King wasn't even this bad. I cannot believe the level of depravity, the level of narcissism, the level of uh, complete lack of self-awareness that, that every single person in this documentary had. And, like, I don't mean to say every single person. There was a handful of people that were there for the right reasons, who are good people, who tried to help Natalia. But... I am disappointed in humanity after watching this. I'm so, so livid at what happened to this little girl. Uh, so we are going to talk about that. That's actually the video that I'm going to be working on next. So stay tuned for that. But before we dive into today's video, which also is making my blood boil, <laughs> Let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, HelloFresh. Let's talk about food and how it's really important for you, you know, for your life to continue, but how it seems like we never have enough time to make sure that the food we're putting into our bodies is good and nutritious. At least for me, personally speaking, I know for a long time it was more about what was fast and convenient, but no more. Now that HelloFresh has been in my life, making it fun and easy to eat better. You can get mouth-watering seasonal recipes and fresh pre-measured ingredients to 
delivered right to your door with HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. This summer, HelloFresh is here to take the work out of eating well so you can enjoy the fun, the sun, the pool, the water park. Whatever you do in the summer, you can enjoy that because HelloFresh is going to take out all of the responsibility around shopping, planning, and preparing meals. You can reach your goals with delicious calorie smart and protein smart lunch and dinner options. Plus, HelloFresh has new vegan recipes as well. Figuring out what is for dinner this summer has never been easier because HelloFresh delivers exactly what you need to create delicious chef-inspired meals directly to you. Personally, I love the fact that the ingredients are not only fresh, they are very fresh, with the seasonal veggies, fruits, and herbs being picked at peak ripeness and arriving from the farm to your table in less than seven days, but the ingredients are also pre-portioned, so you're only getting exactly what you need for each recipe. That means no more food waste, no spoiled containers of sour cream or wilted lettuce filling up your refrigerator which then you have to add on like an hour or two of your week to clean that out. And then you feel guilty because you bought all this food and you didn't use it. And I love that HelloFresh sends a recipe card with easy step-by-step directions for each recipe with pictures. So these meals are virtually impossible to mess up. You'd have to try purposely to mess up making these meals. My family and I love spending time outside by the pool in the summer. We like having people over and entertaining our friends and our family. And HelloFresh is going to be a game changer this season. HelloFresh not only has new snacks, meals, and more to add on to your weekly order, like their fun s'mores bundles for kids and adults who like s'mores. Don't judge me. But they're also going to make entertaining super easy with a selection of crowd-pleasing eats like their bratwurst bar with caramelized onions, Dijonet slaw, and pineapple relish. (gasps) So good. Or their snack board with pretzel bites, spiced bar nuts, and hot honey peach jam. So you don't have to put together all these charcuterie boards. You don't have to go shopping and, you know, make little radishes that look like flowers so that your mother-in-law doesn't judge you for not being a good host. (laughs) You can just let HelloFresh do it. And right now, if you want to try HelloFresh out for yourself, you can click the link in the description box and use code stephanieharlow 16 for 16 free meals plus free shipping. HelloFresh is something that everyone will like, even your pickiest eaters, even your kids, even your mother-in-law. And it's super fun preparing these meals with whoever you have in the kitchen with you, whether it's your husband, your wife, your partner, your your kids. My kids love jumping in and helping me cut things up, and they like to look at the recipes too. And even Bella, who's six and can't read, can follow along with the recipes because of the pictures. So it's just a great experience. And the meals, the food, the prepared food tastes so, so good. Like, I, that's the most important part, and I don't think we focus on that enough. All the food that we make with HelloFresh tastes amazing. It's good quality. You can tell. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code StephanieHarlow16 at checkout for 16 free meals plus free shipping. Thank you so much to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. And let's dive into the case. Okay, so I sat in front of my computer after researching this case. And I contemplated for a good 30 minutes on where I should start. This went from being a case where there wasn't enough information to make a full video on to being a case where there is so much to talk about, I literally did not know where to start. And admittedly, that's uncommon for me. Contemplating something for 30 minutes is also not normal for me. The research phase of my process is usually the thinking phase. The writing phase is the doing phase. So this was a a really uncommon occurrence for me to sit there and be like, I just don't know where to start. I don't know where to start. But in this in this scenario, in, in this context, I want to start by saying I am so very sad about what happened to the victims in this case. And those victims are 35-year-old Holly Guess, her son, 15-year-old Michael Mayo, her daughters, 17-year-old Riley Allen and 13-year-old Tiffany Guess, and Tiffany's two friends, 14-year-old Ivy Webster and 15-year-old Brittany Brewer. I am so devastated about what happened to these people. Not one of them deserved this, and I'm sure not one of them expected this. All six of these people were found by police, shot to death at the hands of registered sex offender Jesse McFadden before he turned the gun on himself. Now, I also want to say that for the most part, I do try to be fair to law enforcement. 
when we talk about these cases. I know that there are some content creators who will just go in on the police department of every case they cover. No matter what the police did, they will try to find something, anything that was done wrong so that they can villainize them and put the focus there. I also know that there are some content creators who blindly defend law enforcement no matter what they've done wrong to the point where they can't objectively highlight flaws in the investigation for the purposes of being productive and learning something from it and trying to do better next time. I personally do try to be objective. Um, I have my biases like anybody else, but I like to think that I try to be fair and I hope that I come off that way. I understand that there's good and bad people in every police department and law enforcement agency across not just this country, but this world. And being a cop, you know, a good cop, a cop who's doing the right thing is a very hard job. And there's so many of them out there who are being good cops and doing the right thing and putting their lives in danger to protect, you know, people who most of the time just talk shit to them anyways. So I, I really do try to be fair. But in this case, I can't, I can't, I can't find anything defensible. I can't find any, anything defensible about this local law enforcement agency. I'm shocked by how poorly everything from the beginning was handled by Henrietta's local law enforcement. Um, it's not even really Henrietta. It's the county. It looks like it's the county more than anything that Henrietta's in. But it's almost unbelievable how bad they they handled this. Unbelievable. And I agree with Ivy Webster's father, Justin Webster, who's been a very loud voice from the start. Shout out to Justin Webster because this is a man who will go hard. He's going to ride hard for his daughter until the very end. And he believes that the police failed miserably in this investigation over and over again. In fact, some might say they failed miserably before they even had to investigate the brutal deaths of six people. I am one of the people who would say that. Whatever local law enforcement's doing in this area of the world, in, in this area of Oklahoma, uh, they, they need to, it needs to be scrapped. They need to start over from scratch, okay? Because clearly they, they don't know their ass from their elbow. They don't know which way is up at this point. And I don't know if it's blatantly just laziness or if it's um, corruption or if it's just like they haven't been trained properly, they don't have good resources, whatever. They suck. They suck. So I guess we should start. <laughs> I guess we should start from the beginning. Henrietta, Oklahoma is a small town with a population of about 6,000 people. It's located just south of Tulsa and about 90 miles east of Oklahoma City. Now, I actually have a random mental connection to Henrietta because years ago, years ago, I read this young adult book series by an author called PC Cast, and the series is called the House of Night series, um, like vampires and stuff. But one of these characters in, in this book series was from Henrietta. And one of my aunt's names is Henrietta, but her name is spelled the typical way, you know, that you'd expect to see. So seeing Henrietta spelled with a Y, like Henry, and then Etta, like Henry Ford and Etta James put together. Um, so seeing that spelled like that in the book series, it was such like a cognitive, I don't know, crossroads, I guess. It just stuck in my brain and I never forgot it. And now I think there are going to be a lot of people who never forget Henrietta, Oklahoma, but for a much less quirky ADHD reason. Because Henrietta, Oklahoma, was also home to registered sex offender Jesse McFadden, who was convicted of rape in 2003, first degree rape. He was released from prison in 2020, and then he married a local woman named Holly Guess in 2021. Now, she wasn't actually local to Henrietta. She moved there from Texas. But either way, at the time when he met her, she was living locally in Henrietta. Now, we do need to discuss McFadden's history because by all accounts, this was a man who raised all sorts of red flags. You know, like Dale Cooper's holding back there. He was uh, basically a walking red flag. If you um, cut open his body and looked inside, just probably a plethora of red flags would be shooting into your face. And in my opinion, and, and I think the opinion of many others, he should never have been allowed to be around minor children, much less living with three of them, as he was when he moved in with his girlfriend, who would become his wife, Holly, and her three kids. In November of 2003, a then 21-year-old Jesse McFadden attended a party with his girlfriend and some of her friends. One of these friends of his girlfriend was 16-year-old Crystal Strong, who said that she didn't really know Jesse. He was merely an acquaintance, the boyfriend of her friend, not someone she knew well. Which also makes me wonder, was Jesse's girlfriend of the younger variety? Was she like a 16 or 17-year-old like, you know, Crystal was? 
because they were friends, so they were probably around the same age. And like I said, he was 21, so weird. But either way, Crystal didn't know Jesse well, just through her friend. And that's why she was surprised that after she left the party and went home, she was awoken by a loud and persistent banging on her door, the front door of her house. And when she opened the door of her house, she found Jesse McFadden standing outside. Jesse told her that he and his girlfriend, her friend, had just broken up and he needed a place to crash for the night. And Crystal was like, that's great, but that's your problem. That's your business. I don't know you. You can't stay here. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, right? She started to close the door. He forced the door open and pushed her back into the house. Jesse McFadden then proceeded to tie Crystal up with various things that he found around her house, like belts and bungee cords belonging to her father, bungee cords that people use, you know, for like doing car work and things like that. Jesse shoved a sock into Crystal's mouth and he raped her while holding a knife to her throat, promising that if she screamed or made a noise, he would kill her. After he raped her, Crystal said that Jesse began to pace around the house like he was worried, he was stressed, he was concerned about what he had just done and about getting in trouble for it. And Crystal, afraid that he was going to kill her, um, she said, don't worry, I won't tell anyone, I'll be quiet, you, you won't get in trouble for this. When Jesse left, Crystal immediately called the police and they found Jesse about half a mile away or about a mile away by the Canadian River. He had slit his wrists, reportedly. This reminds me of a case we covered, I think, last month, Lisa Marie Gray, uh, when she was abducted and raped by a man who, after raping and killing her, he went and, like, tried to, you know, he slit his wrists and carved into his his uh, chest, I'm sorry, you know, and then they found him and he was fine because, in my opinion, Jesse McFadden didn't, you know, actually attempt to take his own life. He probably just wanted people to think he felt badly about what he had done. I don't know. But either way, when the police found him, Jesse McFadden was arrested. And 11 days after the rape of Crystal Strong, he entered an Alford plea, which we've talked about in, in several other cases, specifically the West Memphis Three, um, Michael Peterson. Alford plea means that uh, Jesse was pleading guilty, but maintaining his innocence at the same time. He was saying, I know you guys have enough evidence to find me guilty if this goes to like a jury trial. But I'm still saying I'm innocent, but I also acknowledge you have enough evidence to find me guilty. So I'm just going to, you know, put in an Alford plea. That's the audacity of this person. He raped her and then he was like, I'm innocent, but I know you can probably find me guilty. So I guess I'll just go along with it. He thought he was innocent. He couldn't even just plead guilty and admit to what he had done. That was wrong. Now, after the attack on her, Crystal Strong claims that she received a call from another girl, another young girl, who claimed that Jesse McFadden had sexually assaulted her on the bus three years prior when she was in the sixth grade. She said he'd also threatened to kill her if she ever told anyone about what he had done. And let's just do the math quickly because this is not explicitly said, but you know how my mind works. And I'm sure this is how your mind works, too. Like, how old was this girl at the time? She's in sixth grade. And how old was Jesse McFadden? Well, it looked like this happened on the school bus. So in order to be on the same school bus, Jesse McFadden would have still needed to be in school, like enrolled in high school at the time of this assault, which reportedly happened in 2000. And since we know he was 20 or 21 in 2003, that means he was 18 or 19 in 2000, which means he was probably a high school senior while his victim was in the sixth grade, meaning she was either 12 or 13. So just let that sink. After entering his plea, his Alford plea, Jesse McFadden was sentenced to 20 years in prison, while he also served eight years concurrently at the same time for a grand larceny charge, which also, this charge was also from 2003, and apparently it stemmed from Jesse stealing $64,000 from his grandfather. So he's just a great guy. It doesn't matter if you're a stranger or you're related by blood to him. He will screw you over. And in October of 2004, a year into his 20-year sentence, like, listen to this, a year into his 20-year sentence, Jesse McFadden was already writing a letter to the judge on his case begging for a sentence reduction, saying he understood what he had done was wrong, even though you didn't take accountability for it because you took an Alfred plea, and he said he was working on becoming a better person. In this letter to the judge, he wrote, quote, I know what I've done was a horrible thing to do to another person. I can't begin to understand how I've changed the victim's life or how I've made her family feel feel very bad for what I've done. It's something that I think about every day. I sit and think about how I can change what I've done, but no matter how much I'd like to, 
There's no changing the past, so future is all that's left to me. End quote. Jesse claimed that in order to become this better person, he was going to take GED classes in prison. He was going to learn a trade so he could be better prepared for the real world. He was going to go to rehab classes to address his problems with drugs and alcohol. And he even claimed that he wished he could take a sex offenders class, but the facility he was imprisoned at didn't offer such a course, so he couldn't. Jesse wrote, quote, I want to do all of this because I'd like to get out and prove that I have changed and am a better person, end quote. It's always amazing to me how quickly people change for the better in prison, you know? It's like this guy hasn't even been on the inside for a year, and he's already claiming that he's, like, changed, and he's, like, becoming a better person. A better person who somehow now understands the difference between right and wrong, where a year prior when he took the Alford plea and a year prior when he committed the crime, he did not understand the difference between right and wrong. It's, like, a huge improvement, honestly. I think whenever any of us are having a bad time of it, or we feel like, you know, stuff's happening in our lives and maybe we're not our best selves, we should just go to prison for a few months or a few years because it really does seem to give people a complete moral makeover, okay? It changes them every time, every time somehow. But of course, Jesse said he couldn't prove that he was this changed man if he had to serve his full sentence. Of course not. Jesse told the judge that the longer he was locked up, the less chance he would have of making a decent living and having a good life. He said, quote, I'll be almost 40 years old when I get out. Most people are getting settled into their lives and preparing for retirement. I'll just be starting out, end quote. I guess you should have thought of that before you stuffed a sock into the mouth of a 16-year-old girl and brutally raped her, you dickhead. What is he talking about? Like, oh my god, like, by the time I get out of prison, I'll be like 40, and everyone else will have their lives on track, and I'll, I'll just have to be starting to get my life on track. And, and, that's called accountability. That's called, like, you're paying a price for the wrong you did to somebody else unbelievable. Jesse also lamented that he was worried if he had to stay behind bars for that long, he wouldn't be able to make things right for those that he harmed, like his grandfather, who he stole a lot of money from. Jesse said, quote, I'm afraid that if I'm locked up for 20 years, that he won't be around for me to pay him back and try to rebuild the relationship that I had with him before, end quote. Should I say he should have thought about that before? Or am I being too repetitive? And how do you think you're going to pay back $64,000 that you stole? What did you do with $64,000, by the way? What did you do with $64,000? Where did it go? That's a lot of money to steal and then just, like, spend very quickly. Like, where did where did it go? So obviously, because it's ludicrous, the judge denied Jesse McFadden's sentence modification request. And Jesse didn't seem to learn his lesson because he found himself in trouble again in July of 2016 while still in prison after a contraband cell phone he'd been using was confiscated. And when the cell phone was looked into, it was discovered that Jesse had been texting back and forth with another 16-year-old girl named Caitlin Babb. Reportedly, McFadden asked Caitlin for nude pictures um, from her. He wanted her to send him nude pictures of herself, even though he knew she was only 16. And he sent her nude pictures of himself because who who wants that? Who wants that? What woman wants naked pictures of Jesse McFadden? Please, just in the comments, let me know. Disgusting. And apparently, Jesse also spoke in explicit detail about the sexual things that he wanted to do to Caitlin and the things he was going to do to her once he got out of prison early, which is what he was trying to do while he was messaging her. You know, he kept telling her, you know, I'm, I'm going to get out of here soon. Don't worry. And then we'll be together, this, this, and that. And apparently, uh, Jesse got the cell phone from somebody else. Like, however, the cell phone came to him, it was somebody else's first, and the contact list was still in there. And apparently Caitlin's contact was in this cell phone. And so I guess he just like started texting people on the contact list. He got her. She was groomed by him. She believes that she was groomed by him. And he convinced her that he loved her and he cared about her. But all he wanted was, you know, the sexual gratification. She figured that out. And then her grandmother figured out that Caitlin was texting with this guy in prison. And the grandmother contacted prison officials, the phone was confiscated, et cetera, et cetera. And in 2017, McFadden was charged with soliciting sexual conduct from a minor and possession of CP. You guys know what CP stands for, right? Child blank, you know, think about pictures, think about videos with children in it, why a person like McFadden might get in trouble for having that. That's what CP stands for. And you might think that this charge, this new thing that he did in prison, it would lengthen his sentence or even perhaps make it less possible for him to get out of prison before his original sentenced 20 years was up, you know, because 
it kind of shows that he can't be rehabilitated. And he is, in fact, not a better person. And being in prison couldn't even stop him from pursuing his illegal and harmful compulsions. But you would be wrong if you thought that. In fact, it doesn't look like Jesse McFadden suffered any real consequences while in prison for doing this. I mean, like he had like his visitations revoked and I think he had to go into like solitary for a couple weeks, whatever, but nothing serious, nothing like long term. Well, I lied. Okay, I lied. According to Kay Thompson, the Oklahoma Department of Corrections spokesperson, McFadden had been a level four inmate for the majority of his incarceration, which means that he was behaving himself. He was exhibiting an outstanding attitude and relationship with fellow inmates and prison staff. But he was changed to a level one inmate of January 2017 following this misconduct with the cell phone. And which is like the worst, I guess. Level one is the worst. But then he was returned to a level four just five months later in June of 2017. So I guess he became a good person again really quickly. That's what prison will do to you. I'm telling you. It's like better than rehab. It's better than a spa. Go to prison. Be a good person really quick. And then even after the cell phone thing, while that charge was still pending and he hadn't like gone to trial for it, he hadn't been prosecuted for it, nothing, in October of 2020, Jesse McFadden was released from prison for his first-degree rape conviction after serving just over 16 years of his 20-year sentence, even though he now had these new charges from 2016. But don't worry. Spokesperson Kay Thompson has an answer for that as well. Quote, inmate Jesse McFadden was sentenced to 20 years in 2003 and was received into ODOC custody in January of 2004. Per state statute for his conviction, McFadden had to serve no less than 85% of his sentence, which is a minimum of 17 years. Inmates are given credit for time served within county jails, which in his case was 76 days, end quote. So apparently in Oklahoma, and I'm sure other states, you only have to serve 85% of your sentence before being considered for release. Which, like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Why even bother having a sentence then? Okay, why not just say, like, Whatever, we'll just let you out when we feel like it or when the prisons become too crowded or when you've manipulated us, uh, you know, into thinking you're a good person again and you've been rehabilitated. Why even have a sentence at this point? You're just going to arbitrarily be like 20 years, but not really, <laughs> you know. But the question is, how was Jesse even considered for release after continuing to reoffend in prison like he did with the 16-year-old victim that he was texting back and forth in prison? We're getting ahead of ourselves, but we are going to talk about that. So Jesse McFadden is released from prison and he's allowed to walk around amongst us like he's a normal person, except for a short period of time. On November 10th, 2020, a bench warrant was issued for McFadden in the case concerning Caitlin Babb, the 16-year-old that he texted while he was in prison. And on November 16th, 2020, McFadden was arrested for this and his bond was set at $25,000, which he posted three days later and he was once again released. So like I said, he spent about three days behind bars after he was released for what happened to Caitlin, and then a trial was scheduled. But the problem is the trial for this case would continue to be pushed off for the next several years due to a plethora of things, like one of the prosecuting attorneys like broke their ankle, which is like, what, you can't talk? You're an attorney. All you do is talk, okay, and sit and research. No one's asking you to run on a treadmill while you prosecute this dude. Your ankle's okay. You can sit down and prosecute him. But the prosecutor, like, twisted their ankle or something. And then one of McFadden's defense attorneys died. And then, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic also was responsible for pushing this trial off continually. Because, remember, Jesse gets out in 2020. And his trial doesn't actually go down until March 1st of 2023. So between being released at the end or in the fall of 2020... And having his trial at the beginning of 2023, Jesse McFadden is once again walking free. He meets Holly Guess when she moved to Henrietta with her three children in 2021. And by May of 2022, Jesse and Holly were married and living together along with her three children at a property that they rented in Henrietta, Oklahoma. Holly was described as being a doting parent who worked from home selling life insurance. Her mother, Jeanette Mayo, said, quote, She was a fantastic mother. She loved her children beyond belief. She was overprotective. She was supportive if they wanted to do something. She'd go out 100 percent, end quote. Now, an example of Holly going all out for her children was, you know, when her son Michael went to play football. Apparently, Holly got the whole family T-shirts and sweatshirts for the team to show their support for Michael and the team he was playing on. 
But according to Jeanette Mayo, her new son-in-law, Jesse McFadden, was not such a great person or parent. He was a con man, she said, a con man who controlled Holly and her kids' lives. Jeanette said that McFadden dictated where Holly went. And he would track her cell phone if she left the house at any time. On top of all of that, it appears that Jesse McFadden lied to Holly and her family about his past. Jeanette Mayo said that she had discovered McFadden's history with sex crimes pretty recently, actually. But when she had told her daughter about what she discovered, Jesse McFadden just lied to Holly. He even went so far as to hire a woman to contact Holly under a Facebook profile, a fake Facebook profile that McFadden had created, pretending to be Crystal Strong, who was his 2003 victim, the 16-year-old from 2003, the first-degree rape conviction. And this woman that McFadden hired and paid money to contact Holly and lie to her reportedly told Holly that, listen, these charges were way overblown, we were like in a relationship, and I was 19 when it had happened, not 16. So he's just basically in prison for a mistake, or he went to prison for a mistake. That's what this person told Holly, this woman told Holly. And don't get me started on what kind of woman would take money to do this because not the good kind. But, yeah, that actually happened. And apparently after all of this happened, all of this death that just recently happened, this woman reached out to Holly's family and confessed and told them, like, this is what I did. I feel bad about it, which I guess is whatever. You know, you feel bad about it, but what's done is done, right? As Jesse McFadden said, we can't change the past. We only have the future now. So maybe, you know, next time you won't do something that's stupid and insensitive and harmful. But Jeanette Mayo believes that McFadden had Holly fooled and manipulated because she says Holly would never have put her children in a position of danger if she had known who her new husband really was or if she had accepted who he really was. Jeanette said, quote, he lied to my daughter and convinced her it was all just a huge mistake. He was very demure. He was very standoffish, generally very quiet. But he kept my daughter and the kids basically under lock and key. He had to know where they were at all times, which sent red flags up, end quote. Now, there's actually another person who'd considered warning Holly about Jesse McFadden, and that person is James Fleming, who had been McFadden's cellmate for 16 months while he, James, was in prison for burglary. Fleming said that McFadden did admit to being behind bars for rape, but he downplayed the circumstances. And he was always trying to manipulate his cellmate in strange ways. James Fleming said, quote, Had I been weaker both physically and mentally, and had I not let him know my boundaries, I think he would have tried to take advantage of me sexually, whether he did it by manipulation or force, end quote. James Fleming said that McFadden clearly had not learned his lesson during his time in prison, and he was very creepy with the few females that he came into contact with while locked up. Reportedly, McFadden would follow a female prison guard around in like a weird stalking type way. And he'd also gotten into trouble for making a woman feel uncomfortable after brushing up against her in the call center where they worked. And this is another conversation that needs to be had, okay? Because prisoners working at call centers, while it's nothing new, this has happened, this has been happening, prisoners have all sorts of jobs, so I understand it happens. But the question is, should men who have a history of violence towards women, who have a history of sexually abusing women, who have a history of raping women, be allowed to A, work in call centers with women, and B, be handed a phone, and be allowed to just call people all willy-nilly, potentially women and children? <laughs> right? <laughs> Should they? That's a good question. I totally see how it could be beneficial for nonviolent offenders, and I know that it is. I read this one um, statement or article by a woman who had been in prison for... I think like insurance fraud or some kind of like financial fraud and, and she was working at the call center and it actually allowed her to save up some money and it gave her like a sense of responsibility. So I see how it could be beneficial for nonviolent offenders. But it also does seem like an unnecessary risk for violent offenders. And it, it doesn't just seem like it, right? Because you guys know me. I had to look into this. It's already been proven to be several times. For instance, in 1998, an imprisoned serial rapist in Washington state was caught sending suggestive notes to callers who were giving their addresses to request information about state parks. So it just seems like an unnecessary risk. Why can't we just, you know, keep them behind bars or put them on an island altogether and then hope that that island sinks into the ocean? On that same vein, why should James Fleming, a nonviolent offender, be forced to share a cell with someone like Jesse McFadden, a violent sexual offender? Can't they put these sexual creeps together in the same cells so that the normal run-of-the-mill, like, fixable prisoners feel safe and comfortable in the place where they are forced to lay their heads at night? This is just terrible. 
James Fleming said that he was eventually released from prison, but when he found out that McFadden was getting released in 2020, he contacted the police, worried that his old prison cellmate might reoffend. James Fleming actually said that McFadden had made such a big impact on him in such a short time. You know, just like being around him was very traumatic to Fleming. It was clear to James Fleming that McFadden was a sexual predator who would not change his ways. Fleming said, quote, he was a danger to society and they completely dropped the ball. They were not worried about public safety when they let him out. If you're in prison for a sexual offense already and you get more sexual offenses in prison, there should be a humongous red flag there. End quote. Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Like I, I've been kind of saying that, right? A hundred percent. That should send a red flag to anyone. So what happened here? Well, we're going to talk about it, but I don't really even have an answer for you. But on top of all of this, right, James Fleming, because it's a small world, James had dated Holly Gass years back. And when he noticed uh, on Facebook, I think, that her last name had changed to McFadden, and then he looked into it and he found out she was married to Jesse McFadden, he said he wanted to reach out and warn her, but he was afraid to do it. He said, quote, I didn't want him to read the messages and retaliate on her. And here we are three or four months later, Holly's dead, her kids are dead, and nothing's ever going to bring them back end quote. Exactly. James Fleming. So if you see something, say something. Okay. But I think it's also indicative of the fact that James Fleming was truly like scared of Jesse McFadden. And what does that tell you about Jesse McFadden? When another grown ass man who spent time in prison was so afraid to reach out and warn somebody because he thought maybe, you know, Jesse would see and yes, retaliate on Holly, but also maybe retaliate on James Fleming. So all of this brings us to the morning of Monday, March 1st, 2023. On this day, Jesse McFadden should have been appearing in court to face the music for what he had done in prison in 2016 to Caitlin Babb, but he did not show up. Now, we didn't know until recently, but the night before his court date, Jesse had sent Caitlin Babb, his 16-year-old victim, who's now 23 years old, he sent her messages on Facebook, and he sent them from a fake account with the name Holly Days. And in my opinion, in these messages, Jesse McFadden was basically telling Caitlin, What's about to happen is your fault. So listen, the message from Jesse McFadden said, quote, I did exactly what I promised I would do when I got out. I got a marketing job making great money and was being advanced. Been there two years now, made a great life like I promised I would do with you. Now it's all gone. I told you I wouldn't go back. This is all on you for continuing this, end quote. So am I wrong? That's what Jesse was telling Caitlin, I think, because you decided to pursue this, Caitlin, because you wanted me to face consequence for the things I did that were morally and illegally wrong. This is on you. It didn't seem that the authorities in, in this area of Oklahoma agreed, though. Even the district attorney, who we're going to talk about a little bit later, he said, like, oh, I didn't read it as that. I didn't read it that way initially. You know, I didn't read it that way. And even uh, police chief Joe Prentice seems to think that Jesse was blaming Caitlin for continuing the criminal case against him. But I think, given the timing and, you know, the actual words that he's saying, what's about to happen is your fault is more suggestive of, you know, what I'm saying. Like, I'm going to do something because you wanted to keep going with this because you wanted to continue it, even though I was trying to live a good life and be a good person, because you wanted to keep pushing this. What's about to happen is your fault. Now, what I would like to know is if Caitlin reached out to law enforcement after getting these messages and they wrote it off like Joe Prentice just did, saying like, oh, he means he's mad that he's about to go back to prison, which caused them to not dig deeper into what McFadden actually meant because they just assumed that he meant that he didn't want to go back to prison. And so him going back to prison, what was going to happen was her fault because he was going to go back to prison. That's what they thought he meant by that. And because they just assumed, they didn't look at what he was actually doing at the time that he wrote those messages. And if they had cared to hop into the car and take a little drive and check on him, maybe his victims would still be alive. And I do believe um, almost 100 percent, as much as as certain as I can be, I do believe that Caitlin did show these texts to law enforcement the night before when she got them, because the district attorney will later say, well, when I read those messages on Sunday night, they had a very different meaning to me. So yeah, it looks like she did. So nobody went to check on Jesse McFadden after he said things like that, even though he's texting his victim that he's about to like see in court, and that shouldn't be allowed anyways. But if they had cared to check up on him and just see like what his mindset was, maybe his victims would still be alive today. We've also recently found out that Jesse had spoken to his mother just before the murders. Sheriff's investigator told a judge, this was in a request for a search warrant, that Jesse McFadden called his mommy 
on the evening of April 30th and talked to LaDonna McFadden, that's mommy, about killing himself. LaDonna McFadden told a, a reporter, like a couple days later, after the massacre, the mass suicide that he committed, and then the you know mass murder suicide, um, she said to the reporter, my heart is breaking for the victims. I don't understand it. I never ever would have expected anything like this. And yet she told a sheriff's investigator that that monster called her on the evening of April 30th, talked about killing himself. So that's pretty new, pretty shocking. Now to be fair, um, what this news anchor is saying uh, is a little like I think dramatic and hyperbolic. I'm trying to be fair. To be fair, we don't know the dynamic between Jesse McFadden and his mother. We don't know if he was just a generally dramatic person who was always saying things like this. And it's not as if he said, "I'm going to kill myself and six other people, Mom." You know, he said, "I'm not. I can't go back. I'll I'll take my own life before I go back to prison." That's you know, I think a standard thing for for people to say when they get out of prison, like that it was such a bad experience for them, they would rather be dead than go back. And his mother may have been used to him saying things like this, especially because he's been dealing with the charges from Caitlin Babb since he got out of prison in 2020. You know, he probably said things like, I'll die before I go back to prison. Like I said, it's common sentiment to have, I believe. Now, Brittany Brewer and Ivy Webster were friends of Tiffany Guess, who was Jesse McFadden's 13-year-old stepdaughter, Holly Guess's daughter. In fact, Ivy and Tiffany Guess were best friends, and they had been since Ivy's family had moved to the area from Texas two years prior. And Ivy's brother, Parker, had also become close to Tiffany's brother, Michael. The two families lived less than a mile away from each other, and it seemed like Tiffany and Michael were always at Ivy's or the other way around with Parker and Ivy being at Tiffany's house or, you know, Jesse McFadden's house. Now, I've pieced together portions of interviews done by Ivy's parents, Justin and Ashley, so that they can tell you how familiar they were with Jesse McFadden and his family. And that's that's the other thing about this story is we didn't just lose Ivy. It was just the weekend before that we were telling Tiffany that we're going to give her a key to our house because of how much she was here and how those two girls were connected at the hip. They did everything together. And Michael and Riley, they were always at our house. And had you ever met um, this Jesse McFadden? I mean, had you ever interacted with him? I mean, what? Tell me a little bit about that. So I can tell you on a couple accounts. Thank you. I can tell you on a couple accounts that you know most of the time that we seen Jesse was during drop off. You know, if we dropped Ivy off over there, or um, you know, Tiffany or one of the other kids were staying the night here. Um, they would come in the house and we would maybe chit chat for 10, 15 minutes, talk about work, talk about Holly's uh, arts and craft as she does. And um, yeah, we, we had interactions. I, I remember one time we went to Jim Hall Lake where he usually goes a lot too. And so I'm hoping OSBI will investigate there as well. Um, but, you know, the, he met us out there with the girls to go swimming at Jim Hall Lake. And he was out there kayaking and fishing and kind of hanging out with us. But for the most part, I mean, we didn't know the personal side to him. Um, and just knowing who he was based off what our interactions were with him, there was never any signs of maliciousness. He was a monster in disguise and really good at what he did. And obviously, Ivy had never mentioned anything. I mean, had she ever said anything to you about this Jesse McFadden that, hey, he's a little weird or? My wife and I, we felt he was kind of socially awkward, kind of weird. But as I said, you know, nothing malicious. Now, Start from the every, beginning. Okay, so Saturday she was going out. They were going to go to the mall and then main event, which they did, um, and spend the night. And as far as we knew, it was. As uh, they've done before. Yeah. Ivy and Brittany were going to Tiffany's, um, so nothing out of the ordinary. Me and Ivy were Snapchatting up until about midnight Saturday night. Um, and then Sunday, I got a message from her, which was a little different, but I didn't think nothing of it. It was, hey, we're going to run to McAllister. We have to go. Um, Jesse's got to work on, like, the ranch or fence, whatever, which they've gone before. So, again, didn't think nothing of it. But usually I get, hey, Mom, is that okay? Or I love you. Um, 
didn't get that, but I didn't think much. I said, okay, try. She said, we'll be home by five. I said, okay, if you can, a little earlier because, you know, school tomorrow type thing. Okay, I'll let you know type thing. No, I love you. No, none of that. Um, then I get a call from Jesse a little while, about five or so, saying, oh, yeah, we're still out here in McAllister. The phone is really cutting out. Um, not getting good service. I said, okay, keep me updated. And that was the last and contact. That, that probably... I believe the girls were already gone at that point. They never made it to McAllister. He, so. he planned it all. And when he sent that that text or call or whatever to what's her name, the, the girl that he made contact with when he was in jail, uh, the reason why he was going to court, or we supposed to go to court yesterday, he told her that this, what's gonna happen, is gonna be all her fault. So he planned it ahead of time. Why do you feel that your daughter was involved in his... I feel the evil in him wanted to get back at the world. And he wanted to hurt the people that he loved most. And our daughter was best friends with Tiffany, his daughter. And they were inseparable. They did everything together. Okay, so that was a lot. A lot was said, a lot of information to process, and we're going to unpack some of these things. But the basic gist is that Ivy and Tiffany were very, very close friends. They were inseparable, connected at the hip, together all the time. And Ivy had been at Tiffany's house many times before. Brittany Brewer, who was Ivy and Tiffany's friend, had also been to Tiffany's house to hang out and sleep over before. Her parents said Brittany had been at McFadden's no less than four times since Christmas. So this was nothing new, and nothing bad had ever happened to either girl before. And both sets of parents say they had no idea about Jesse McFadden's past or criminal history. They also say that they believe Holly Guess, McFadden's wife, knew. Or they said they think that she knew, and if she did, she should have said something to them. She should have given them the heads up that this is where they were sending their daughters, which I agree with. Also, during these interviews I just played for you, Ivy's mother, Ashley, said a few things that I would like to expound on while she was going over the timeline for Saturday, the last time she saw her daughter. Now, Ashley and her daughter, Ivy, were very close. Ashley said they were best friends. They kept in contact all day long through messaging. Ashley said that that Saturday night when Ivy was sleeping over at Tiffany's, it was around midnight and Ivy was sending her mother Snapchats, you know, goofy pictures with filters and stuff like that. And Ashley responded with a picture of herself and their dog. And Ivy told her mother, you know, it was past her bedtime. Now, Ashley believes this was the last genuine message that she received from her daughter, even though messages would come from Ivy's phone the following day. But as you heard Ashley point out, the tone of those messages on Sunday were different. Ivy said, listen, we're going to a nearby ranch that was owned by Jesse McFadden's family. They'd been to this ranch before, so this was nothing new. But Ashley said that Ivy would usually ask if that was okay, not just tell her mother what was happening and when she would be home. You know, like Ivy in these messages was like, oh, we're going to the ranch and I'll be home around five. And Ashley said, that's different. Ivy wouldn't normally do this. She'd normally say, hey, is it okay? And what time would you like me home by? And I totally get this because my 11-year-old son has a very specific way of talking to me over text, especially when he's asking for something. And if he veered from that, I would feel unsettled. I would notice. Now, in this message that Ashley is sure did not come from her daughter, Ivy, she was told that Ivy would be home around 5 that evening, which would have been Sunday evening. But around that time, Ashley received a call from Jesse McFadden himself. And Jesse told her, you know, they're all okay, they're hanging out on the ranch, but the service is really bad. They're having trouble making calls. Ashley said, quote, he said they weren't getting good service and that he had to walk far enough as it was just to get that little bit of communication. We know that they never made it to the ranch. I believe at that point the kids were already gone, end quote. So it is Ashley's opinion that by the time she spoke to McFadden Sunday evening, he had already ended the lives of her daughter, her friend Brittany, his wife Holly, and her three children. Law enforcement uh, has not stated whether this is true. Law enforcement hasn't really said a lot about anything. Um, they have not confirmed when the deaths happened. But I think that Ashley's take on this is probably pretty accurate. Ivy's friend Brittany's mother, Melena, also felt something was going on when she was unable to get in touch with her daughter on Saturday. Melena said, quote, I knew something was wrong because she wasn't answering my call. I mean, I tried to call. I got online on her Facebook and tried calling her, video calling her, and I messaged her, and she wouldn't respond, and it showed she was online. 
but she wouldn't respond, so I knew something was wrong, end quote. Now, I believe that whatever happened to these people started happening in the early morning hours of a Sunday, which would be technically, if you hadn't gone to sleep yet, Saturday night. And as we know, Ashley was getting Snapchats from Ivy around midnight, but I think something happened after that because that's when Melina was trying to get a hold of Brittany in the evening. And there's some reporting online that the girls were last seen in Henrietta around like 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I think that somebody probably saw them on the property and then that person left. And whatever happened to them happened after that. But I believe it started in the early morning hours of Sunday and continued um, for several hours because this wasn't just a, in my opinion, based on what I know from this case, I don't know for sure, but this wasn't just a, oh, I'm going to you know kill some people and it'll take me like 20 minutes and then that's done. Like there were ulterior motives here. And I believe that there was an extended period of, of torture. Brittany Brewer and Ivy Webster were reported missing by their parents. And around 8 a.m. on Monday, May 1st, the Oklahoma Highway Patrol issued a missing and endangered emergency alert for the two teens, noting that they were said to be in the company of 39-year-old Jesse McFadden. At 10 a.m., the initial call came in to dispatch to law enforcement with instructions to locate McFadden after he'd missed his court date in Muskegee County, and a judge issued a bench warrant for his arrest. Deputies arrived to serve the warrant at the rented home where Jesse McFadden lived, and they were there for 19 minutes before leaving. Not long after, another call came in from a relative of Holly Guess, wanting to report her as missing. This caller said they had not seen Holly or her kids since April 28th, and they hadn't been able to get a hold of any of them either. Now, it doesn't say who this caller was, but the caller is referred to as a he, and the reports mentioned that he told uh, dispatch that he was en route. He was driving from Westville to Henrietta. So I wonder if this caller was one of Holly's exes, possibly father, to one or more of her children. I believe it would probably be Tiffany's father because that was her most recent um, relationship. And it looks like Tiffany's father was very involved in all three of the kids' lives. A third and final call came in to dispatch at 2.22 p.m. And this brought law enforcement to McFadden's property again. And this time there was an attempt to serve a search warrant. Deputies were clearly unable to get any response when they knocked on the door. And so they began to search the property, at which point they discovered the bodies of Holly Guess, Riley Allen, Michael Mayo, Tiffany Guess, Brittany Brewer, and Ivy Webster. Jesse McFadden was there too, dead, but fuck him. Now I wonder, when law enforcement arrived at the property at 10 a.m. that morning, and they stayed for 19 minutes and they couldn't get an answer, so they just left. Were these victims still alive? I think so. I think that they were still alive inside the house, restrained and not able to get help. But I do believe that they were still alive when uh, law enforcement showed up. So once again, if they had pursued Jesse McFadden, if they had said, well, this guy is a sex offender, he's a registered sex offender, and he's got minors in there, and we can't find Ivy, and we can't find Brittany, and they're supposed to be, you know, spending the night at his house, we're just going to go in. Like, that's probable cause. Let's bust in this door. If that had happened, then maybe these people would still be alive. But I also think that the police showing up at 10 a.m. probably signaled to Jesse McFadden, like, okay, I got to get this done quick. Um, I've got to finish this. Once again, these are just my personal beliefs, my personal theories based on what I know of this case so far. Now, since this gruesome discovery, police have referred to the scene as being staged. The bodies of Ivy, Brittany, and Riley were found about a quarter mile southwest of the McFadden residence, and each body was separated by approximately 100 to 150 yards. Holly, Michael, Tiffany, and I assume Jesse, they were found a bit further away on a wooded area on the property. Police believe that Jesse McFadden used a 9mm handgun to kill his victims. They all had been shot between one to three times in the head. Some sources report that it appears some of the victims were able to get free and run away, and then McFadden hunted them down and killed them. Um, I'm not sure if that's true because the uh, police chief, Joe Prentice, claimed that he believed the bodies had been moved from where they were originally killed, and that's why they were staged. So I don't know if the bodies are located where they are because some people got away and they had to be tracked down, or if because they were moved to specifically be in those locations. And if they were moved to specifically be in those locations, I don't know the motive for that, and I don't know why. But based on what would later be found in that house, not found by the police, might I add. Not found by the police, might I add. <laughs> Ooh, I'm getting upset already. Based on what would later be found in the house, it appears that what some or all of these victims endured before their deaths was actual torture. So now let's move on to how badly the local police handled this situation with Jesse McFadden and this investigation from the literal beginning. And it's not even just the police. It's every person in a capacity to have done something different. 
to have done something different to have protected people from Jesse McFadden. Everybody did something wrong. But let's start with the initial investigation after the police found the bodies. From what I can tell, because McFadden's rented property was in an unincorporated area on the outskirts of Henrietta, the Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office was in charge of the investigation, not the Henrietta Police. And reportedly, the Sheriff's Office, the Sheriff's Department, sealed off the scene. They went into the house, and then they went around the property collecting evidence, and then they left. And they were like, wait, we're done with our investigation. Anybody can come in here if you want. Anybody can come into this house. So it's not as if they were like, we're going to come back and get more evidence. They literally were like, we're done. And it appears that some of Holly's family members went into the home afterwards, as well as members from Ivy Webster's family, who were looking for some of Ivy's belongings, including her cell phone, which was still missing. Since the police were done with the crime scene, right, done, out of there, like we have no more evidence to collect, done. The family got permission from the landlord to go into the house, and the landlord said, yeah, go ahead, go in, because within a few days, I'm cleaning this bitch out, and I'm throwing everything that's in here in the dumpster, which some people find suspicious. We're going to touch on that a little bit, a little bit later, towards the end of the video. Now, strangely enough, after claiming they had completed this investigation, and they were done, like, collecting evidence, the sheriff's office announced during a press conference that they did not have evidence to suggest a motive at this point. On Wednesday, police chief Joe Prentice said there was no witnesses, so there was no evidence. Again, I follow the evidence and I don't have any evidence to indicate what the actual motive was. And I'm gonna be honest with you folks, normal people that understand care, love, compassion, wouldn't understand if I could come up with it anyway. Which is a cop out, honestly. You and I, Right? We're not, we weren't in that house. We didn't collect any of this evidence. But at this time, we know enough about Jesse McFadden and his history with young women, his violence and his sexual violence towards young women, his situation with the court date. We know enough, okay? Context clues to piece together what happened here. Like, we can figure out the motive. And just because the motive of a bad person is out of the realm of understanding for average people who aren't murderers, that doesn't mean we just don't try to figure it out. And that's what it really seemed like law enforcement wanted us to do in this case. Seven people are dead, but one of them is the perpetrator. So there's no bad guy to chase and catch. What do you want us to do? Figure out why he did it and how we can <laughs> prevent things like this from happening in the future? What are we? Social workers? <laughs> Mind hunter? It's over. Case closed, right? Joe Prentice kept saying that there's no witnesses. So... We don't know what happened. We can speculate, but we'll never know exactly what happened to these victims in that house because the only people who would be able to tell us are no longer here. It really felt like the police were just like, I mean, this case has a conclusion now. The person who did it is gone. So what's left to figure out? But when Justin Webster and his family went into that house, they found plenty of evidence to suggest a motive. Um, and to suggest deeper things, too. And they found a ton of physical evidence, including electronics, that the police had just not collected. Either they hadn't seen those things, or they didn't think they were important enough to collect and catalog. Now, what was found in the home of Jesse McFadden has prompted people to start calling it the Henrietta House of Horrors. A father's search for answers leading him into a house of horrors. Nobody prepared for what was inside or the potential evidence missed by investigators. Well, Adria, Kevin, we first want to warn you, the images you're about to see from inside the home are disturbing. It was hard to watch Ivy's family as they discovered what they believe is crucial evidence that was left behind by law enforcement. In a matter of minutes, they found their own daughter's cell phone tucked away in a cabinet, and that was just the beginning. Now they're wondering whether law enforcement dropped the ball. We can't have parents go through all oh, yeah. I'm angry. This should have never happened. His daughter Ivy was only 14 years old when Jesse McFadden murdered her. Okmulgee police say Ivy died from a gunshot wound to the head. Her family has zero answers, couldn't say goodbye, and has no closure. So now, they're looking for it. I feel that my daughter, even right now, is standing behind me, telling me to keep going, keep doing this phone or phone case. Thursday afternoon, News 4 was invited by Webster and his family to take a closer look at where his daughter took her last breath. Behind these walls, the family found sex and bondage devices. In one of the bedrooms were restraints bolted into the bed frame. There was also a shelf filled with books about witchcraft. Ten feet away in the kitchen, another restraint with chains and locks still attached. 
Although there were reportedly four bodies found in this home, we didn't see any blood stains, no blood splatters. In the back room, the most shocking find of it all, crucial items that had not been collected. That's them. It's hey, that's them. Okay, that's is that hers? It. Yep. Okay, hold on. Call the sheriff. Yep. Don't touch them. Don't yep, move yep, them. Yep. Ivy Webster's cell phone was tucked away in a laundry room cabinet, along with two other cell phones and two laptops. In the same room, syringes, what appears to be drug residue, and various items the family believes was used to torture their daughter before she was murdered. None of it collected by law enforcement until this family called the Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office and asked them to come back to the home and retrieve these items. Before we continue on with this clip, and it's good because Justin politely and respectfully tells one of these detectives off in a way that only a country boy who was raised right could do. And I don't even know if I have that part on the clip, but Justin's very patient. He's like, I know that you're hurting too, and I know that you're upset, but like, this is my daughter. You know, this is my daughter, and I need answers. So before we go into that clip, I want to go over some specifics of what the Websters found in the house. And everything they found, they didn't touch, all right? So for those of you who are like, oh, well, then are they ruining the investigation? Like, there's no investigation to ruin. There's not going to be a trial, okay? So even if they'd touched it, even if they had, you know, ruined the chain of evidence or whatever, it doesn't matter because Jesse McFadden doesn't have a lawyer who is going to use that to throw the case out in trial later. But anyways, they didn't do that. They not only had a news network there documenting it, but they did call the police and they were like, hey, come get your boy, right? Like, come and collect this stuff that you didn't collect to begin with. But all of it is shocking, the stuff that was found in the house. All of it is shocking. And the question of why the police didn't collect it as evidence or how they could see it and still claim to not know the motive, that's going to keep popping up for us. We're going to keep asking that question because, yes, some of this was not in plain sight, but some of it was. How could the police see the stuff that we know would have been in plain sight and um, not think, hmm, this is strange. We need to figure out what's going on here. So Justin Webster, Ivy's father, he called News 4 to come along and document as they made their way through the house because he wanted everything on tape, which was smart. And inside the living room, you can see a twin mattress laying on the floor with a pink patterned bedspread on it. In the corner of that room, there were desktop monitors and a computer tower still hooked up. Two additional computer towers and four more desktop monitors were also found throughout the house. All of these computers should have been taken and forensically analyzed to see if McFadden had been doing things he shouldn't have on there, right? If he'd maybe been in communication with other minors, if he was um, writing to other people like him who have similar proclivities to him and talking about what he was doing to young women. All of those electronics should always be taken in and checked to see if there's anything on them. In a bedroom next to the living room, they found a bed and a bed frame. And the bed frame had restraints bolted into it. And the restraints still had chains and locks attached. In that room, they also found multiple sex and bondage devices, sex toys, lube, things like that. There was another restraint with chains and a lock attached, bolted into the kitchen countertop. And that kitchen was reportedly filled with trash and sticky insect pads covered in roaches. In the laundry room, they found a human dog collar, handcuffs, drug paraphernalia, and various weapons, as well as a syringe with a dark colored substance still in it. Now, can you tell me why the police would not have felt it necessary to collect any of these things as evidence? The syringe with the substance inside? Did you maybe want to collect that stuff, see what the substance was, and then see if that substance is in any of your victims' bodies? Like, do we have to do their job for them? And also in the laundry room, <laughs> uh, kind of hidden in like an overhead cupboard, they found three cell phones and a laptop. And one of the hidden cell phones belonged to Ivy Webster. So they took that phone and they gave, they gave everything to the police, right? They had the police come and collect everything. Now, in Jesse's bedroom, they reportedly recovered five more cell phones and more drug paraphernalia in the closet. Also found by the Webster family were 200-plus copies of letters and journal entries that McFadden had written for his second victim, detailing how much he loved her, wanted to marry her, she was a 16-year-old girl, don't forget, and detailing the explicit sexual things he wanted to do to her. There was also a weird ledger that was found, and we don't have as many details about what was inside the ledger besides the fact that we know there was a list of names, just first names, with the dates of birth. And the last six names on that list belong to the six victims of Jesse McFadden from May 1st. Now, what do the other names on the list represent? That's the question. And based on that and what else was found in the house, many people wonder if Jesse McFadden had killed before and if he was keeping a running log of these victims, adding the last six names of lives he had taken before he took his own life. Once again, why did the police not take any of this stuff? Yes, I understand. 
bad guy's gone. There's no villain to chase. And maybe you feel that figuring out Jesse's motive and what was going on in his head, it doesn't seem productive, right? But realistically, Jesse McFadden could have hurt others. There could be unsolved disappearances that could be solved if you would get your head out of the sand or out of your own ass. There could be parents out there wondering what happened to their daughters and the electronic evidence in that house that you left behind, cell phones and laptops and computer towers. Those might provide those grieving parents with some answers. There could be evidence on those electronic devices. Or, as I mentioned previously, there could be current victims of Jesse's that he'd been grooming online the way he did with his 16-year-old victim in prison. And we should know that so that someone can step in, let their parents know, and get them therapy if that's what's needed. And maybe the parents and loved ones of these six victims have an interest in knowing why one day their lives were completely normal and happy, and the next they were devastated and everything that they knew had been burned to the ground and left in ashes. They might want to know why and try to understand the thought process of Jesse McFadden. They might want to have some answers just because the police don't think it's important because he's gone and the only people who could tell us what happened are, are gone now. No, that's not true, okay, because the evidence can tell a story. The evidence can tell a story. But you left it behind. Now, on that note, let's see what happened after the Websters called the police and told them to get their asses back to the house and collect all the evidence that had been left behind. There you go. Pictures were snapped and the items finally collected, but not without a brief explanation as to why it hadn't been done before. I want more done. The problem is we don't know what else to do. Like... There's a story to be told here. Right. We don't know what happened. Don't exactly. know what else to do. I'm going to say and this. Since we don't have the only person that can tell us what happened, he's dead. But we can try to piece it and together. And I'm going to say this was not done right. I no crime scene tape. We are open to any suggestions you all can give. I'm saying this. They didn't do their job, and the whole world's going to know it. But what what would this accomplish? I'm a grieving parent that my daughter got raped and murdered and you're telling me right now that I don't have a right to know what happened? The story's right here. It's right here. And it's still sitting here. Still! Disgusted with the investigation into his daughter's murder, he only saw more uncollected evidence on his walkout. So it's infuriating to me, right? Because the guy there who's talking and taking pictures, he's like an investigator um, from the sheriff's office. And at first he tried to play it cool. Like, you know, we've done what we can do and we're open to suggestions. If you have them, like, dude, fuck off. Open to suggestions. <laughs> You're the police. You dumbass. You're supposed to know how to do investigations. Not us. Not the parents of little girls who are dead now because you didn't do your job properly by protecting them from a literal registered sex offender living in their backyard. You are the police. You're supposed to know what to do, how to pursue investigations. You don't need freaking suggestions. Like a suggestion box? You're just going to put a suggestion box in the sheriff's office? Like, guys, if you have any, any thoughts about how we could do our job better... Yeah, go ahead and leave them in here, you know, like, you know, and then and then every they're going to like pull them out and start reading them like Michael Scott in that one episode of The Office. And it's like collect evidence from crime scene. By golly, that's a great idea, guys. We should be doing this. Come on, man. Unbelievable. The audacity. As far as the sex toys and the bondages and whatnot, um, I, I can only confirm that the chains and the locks and um, uh like some of the, the marijuana gummies and stuff that we were finding um, that that was purchased that weekend, the, um, I believe the day before, if not that Friday before. Um, I had a receipt in my hand from Walmart from the bag that had the empty package for the padlocks in it and some additional chains in my hand. And uh, I set it on the kitchen counter when the deputies asked us to get out of the house um, after we found some more evidence for them. That was the third time we went back there. And as far as where that receipt went after that, I don't know. Now, as you heard Ivy's father, Justin, say in that clip, he found a receipt from Home Depot, I believe. And it showed that uh, at least some of those locks and chains had been purchased just before the murders. I believe the day before or two days before. So this wasn't really a setup that was always there. Like, you know, it, there weren't always restraints and chains on the bed and in the kitchen counter and things like that. 
it seemed like this was planned and arranged by Jesse McFadden, most likely for this specific occasion. And we also know that Jesse had apparently encouraged his stepchildren to invite other friends over that night. But those other friends, those other young people, those other kids, they couldn't come. So it does appear that he was trying to take out as many innocent people, children, as many innocent children as he could before he turned the gun on himself. The Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office has not given a statement on why they did not collect these items of objectively very important evidence. But um, I think that they're going to have to answer for themselves very soon. I hope they do. And according to TulsaWorld.com, Ivy's father, Justin Webster, believes there's a much larger story here. And he feels that McFadden could have committed other sex crimes or even have accomplices, especially after a legal firm hired by the Webster family found that 32 different cell phones and individuals had used McFadden's address as their location address for their cell phone bill. So that's very interesting. Like I said, there's going to be more information that comes out. We're going to find out, I think, that there was some really bad stuff going on at the home of Jesse McFadden. As of now, the Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office is off the case, and the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigations has taken over. And so far, the Webster family has praised the Bureau's initial efforts, which included a dive team searching ponds located on the property where Jesse McFadden had lived and died. Now, with the investigation firmly in the hands of an agency that clearly knows what they're doing more than local law enforcement, the family members of the victims, along with members of the community and the world, have asked the big question. Why was Jesse McFadden ever allowed to walk out of prison? Why was McFadden released early during his 20-year sentence for a first-degree rape conviction with part of the reason of him being released, given being good behavior? Like they said, oh, because he behaved himself. When we know that his behavior in prison was not good at all, and it's not just the cell phone thing, that should be enough, right? That should be enough, but it's not just the um, texting inappropriate things to a 16-year-old while in prison and asking her for pictures and sending her pictures and explicit messages. That should be enough. But um, it's not just that. Because in the middle of May, Fox 23 received 471 pages of Jesse McFadden's prison records. And these records showed that McFadden had 10 violations while in DOC custody, basically while in prison. In March of 2004, he was found to be in possession of tobacco. In June 2005, he was busted with cigarettes. And in November of 2005, he tested positive for THC. In January of 2007, he got caught outside of his cell during a lockdown. And in February of 2009 and in January of 2010, he got in trouble for what has simply been described as sexual activity. So we do not know what that means. What does it mean? Did he rape one of his fellow prisoners? Did he try to assault a prison guard or a female prison guard? What does it mean? We don't know. But in February of 2010, Jesse got in trouble for battery of another person, most likely another prisoner. And in September of 2013 and July of 2016, he was found to be in possession of a cell phone. So 2016 wasn't even the first time he was caught with a contraband cell phone. And then in December of 2016, he got busted for a law violation, which is related to the investigation about him texting the, the minor girl while in prison, and the CP that was found on his contraband cell phone. Now, those last three violations are considered to be Class X violations, which are the worst type. And according to prior statements from the Department of Corrections, Jesse McFadden was released early after 85% of his sentence because he'd collected enough credits, right, which are earned through good behavior and good hygiene. Fox 23 reported, quote, According to DOC policy, for a second offense of a Class X violation, credits can be revoked. According to the documents, when McFadden was caught with the phone that investigators said had CP on it, no credits were revoked. He was punished for having the phone with a 30-day segregation and restricted visitation, end quote. Oh, what a deterrent. 30-day segregation? I wish somebody would segregate me for 30 days. Restricted visitation? Not even, like, ended visitation, just restricted. Oh, this is terrible. What a huge price to pay for what he did to a 16-year-old girl. So no credits were taken away. Now, if credits had been taken away, then maybe he would not have been released early. Why? Why were no credits taken away when he did that, that Class X violation? Now, it's just not controversial, okay? It's not a hot take to suggest that Jesse McFadden should not have been released early. And he should have been in custody for the charges he incurred while in prison, at least until a trial. Legal analyst Irvin Box stated that after McFadden was released from prison in 2020, he should have been held without bond until he went to trial for the sexting and CP case. Box stated, quote, The district attorney can call in and ask the judge, look, this guy's a danger. He was danger outside the prison. Now he's a danger inside the prison, and we don't want him on the streets again. We want you to hold him without bond. 
why did they release him when he had a 2017 crime he committed against a child while he was in prison? I don't understand that part. End quote. You and I both. You and everyone else watching this, we don't understand that part. And I will say for his part, um, Larry Edwards, who's the Muskegee District Attorney, He seems to be taking accountability, which is rare to find. Uh, I feel like at this point, uh, this man could do the bare minimum of taking accountability and it would impress me. Uh, He was not the DA, the district attorney in 2017. He wasn't elected until 2022. So he wasn't in um, office when McFadden was released or when this crime happened against the 16-year-old while McFadden was in prison. But Edward said, quote, I've second-guessed myself about what could have been done or what should have been done differently, and it's been tough. It's been really tough. We'll be setting higher bonds, fighting to keep people in custody. There are a lot of things. As many people have said, the justice system broke in this case, and it did, end quote. I like to hear somebody who's a part of the justice system admit that it's absolutely, and sometimes it feels irreparably broken, right? Because it is, not just in this case, in many cases, including the case of Natalia Barnett, which we're going to talk about, you know, next time in the next video, but that 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 is blowing my mind still to this day. But anyways, I'm sorry to get distracted. It's still, it's it's bothering me, man. It's like I watched that docuseries last night and I cannot shake how pissed I am about it. But the DA, Edwards, he admitted that his office needs to try sexual and violent crimes faster, not allow the perpetrators to walk around for years while the court systems get their ducks in a row, which I completely agree. If somebody's out on bond, For a violent or sexual crime, they need to be watched. They need to have like some sort of ankle monitor, something, and they need to not be allowed within, you know, a certain amount of distance from people that they could victimize. Like, so just basically keep them behind bars as far as I'm concerned. But after McFadden was released, at least local law enforcement, knowing what he had done and what he was capable of, they would be keeping a very close eye on him, right? Between his release in 2020 and his trial date in 2023, right? Right? Wrong. Wrong. According to the Department of Corrections, quote, through sentencing from the court, McFadden was to register as a sex offender. He was given no probation, however, because he was a lifetime registrant. He had to check in every 90 days with the sheriff's office. He was compliant with the stipulation. Registered sex offenders are allowed to live with their own children and stepchildren as long as they are not a victim of the offender. However, they are supposed to notify the Oklahoma Department of Human Services if they do so. Sex offenders are not required to notify neighbors of their registration status, end quote. No probation. Do you believe it, man? (laughs) He's released early for a first-degree rape conviction, and he has another charge for doing a very similar thing hanging over his head that he hasn't even answered for yet, and he is not put on probation. In Jesse McFadden's specific situation, he was released with no probation officer checking in on him, even though he was going to be living with three minor children, two of them girls, the exact victim that he has always chosen, his victim of choice, his M.O. And this statement said that McFadden was supposed to check in with the sheriff's office every 90 days, which he had been doing, but I don't think you quite understand that these self-check-ins are the equivalent of basically doing nothing. News 4 in Oklahoma filed an open records request and obtained four radio logs and four 90-day self-check-ins pertaining to Jesse McFadden. A self-check-in just means that Jesse would verify his address, phone number, current employer, current vehicles, and current people he was living with to the sheriff's office every 90 days. That's it. But what about home compliance checks, right, which are basically unannounced visits by law enforcement to make sure that the information being provided during the self-check-ins is valid and that everything is going well and that the released sex offender is behaving themselves and they don't have things like, you know, chains and locks drilled into their kitchen counters or their homes aren't roach infested and filled with drugs or the stepchildren haven't become victims of the sex offender. Let's hear what the Oklahoma Department of Corrections and the Okmulgee County Sheriff's Office have to say about home compliance checks on registered sex offenders, which, you know, home compliance checks, many law enforcement officials will tell you, are one of the greatest tools in their kit when it comes to making sure that sex offenders do not reoffend in the months and years after their release. So it, it does seem like home compliance checks are pretty important in this process. But Kay Thompson, who is the spokesperson for the Oklahoma Department of Corrections, says that there are zero state requirements for home compliance checks. And if and when they are done, that's completely left up to local law enforcement. An email from the sheriff's office stated that home compliance checks are done at different intervals. But when they were asked for clarification, they didn't respond. Sheriff Rice claims that home compliance checks are done only when a complaint against a registered sex offender is filed. 
And um, in, I think, a, a very shocking and candid statement, Oak Mulgee County Sheriff's investigator Jason Dawson compared home compliance checks to playing darts, saying, quote, we do compliance checks, but it's like throw a dart, see which we're going to do, because that's all the resources we have to do, end quote. I think that's, once again, a cop out and ridiculous. This is not a highly populated area. And it takes, what, maybe an hour to do a thorough home compliance check, but maybe not in Henrietta. Maybe it would only take like five minutes because it does look like one check was done at McFadden's home by the sheriff's office on June 24th, 2022. But at this point, it doesn't appear that law enforcement even entered the house. Basically, all that happened was they showed up at the house to confirm, like, yes, he's still living here. Yes, this is the vehicle he told us about, blah, blah, blah. And Sheriff Rice said that even if he and his his officers were given permission to walk through the house, he would only be able to enter rooms that had open doors, which I don't think is the case anywhere else. I don't know if that's a law or a rule in Oklahoma, but I know that home compliance checks are done all the time in multiple other states, and this is how they kind of do like stings, and they pull in a lot of sex offenders who are reoffending behind closed doors. And so they are allowed to go and look at their electronics, things like that. I don't know. I don't know why um, Sheriff Rice feels like that he couldn't enter rooms without open doors, but we also know that multiple people complained to law enforcement about McFadden being released. Um, including his ex-prison cellmate, Holly's mother. And there does appear to be a complaint lodged against McFadden on January 29th, 2023, when a female called the sheriff's office anonymously to express concern about Jesse McFadden living with three underage children. This woman wanted her complaint documented, and she wanted McFadden looked into. She wanted the police to go to the house and make sure the kids were okay. But according to the dispatcher notes, McFadden's information was run through the system and it was confirmed that Holly Guess was his wife and the three minor children were her children. So nothing was done. Sheriff Rice confirms that nothing was done after this. They didn't go to the house to check in. They didn't go to the house to ask the kids if they were okay. They didn't do anything, even though we were just told that a complaint against the offender will trigger a home compliance check. That's the only thing that will, allegedly, right? Yet this appears to not be true. Or if it is true, it's followed arbitrarily. I'm not sure why a registered sex offender of children is allowed to live with children and nothing is done to make sure that those children are safe, right? Someone should have been in that house every three months, randomly and unannounced, looking at everything, talking to everyone living there. All right. I understand you can't stop him from getting married and living with his stepchildren. But what you can do is make sure that you're there and present enough so that not only does he know you're there all the time and you're asking questions, but the children know that you're there all the time and asking questions and they have somebody to tell if they need to. Why is this hard? Why do we have to do everybody's job for them? But basically, that's where we're at now in the case. There's been talk about a few people in this case being involved or being suspicious including Holly Guess herself, as well as the landlord of the home that McFadden was renting, and that guy's name is Raymond Paget, apparently. There's questions of whether or not these two people knew what was happening and did nothing, or whether they knew more than they were saying and kind of allowed it to happen. At this point, I don't want to speculate on that. And I know people are going to be mad. They're going to be like, there's plenty of things you can speculate on. I don't want to speculate on it. I can speculate about Jesse McFadden because he's not a victim and because he did this terrible thing. And so I can speculate on why he did it. And I can speculate on, you know, certain things about the the crime based on the evidence. But I don't want to speculate on this particular bit of the case because the information coming out about these two individuals is like thin at best. It's it's kind of weak. It's It's not standing up on its own two legs just yet. And I don't want to take away from Holly being a victim. Not at this point. Not yet. It, if she was involved, if she knew more and, and that's provable and there's evidence of that, then I will, of course, uh, speak out against her. I will absolutely speak out against her. I will um, have no problem doing that. I will condemn her publicly, as I've done with other mothers who put their, their children in positions of danger. But I just don't have that information yet. I don't have anything that's enough to, to say that without without any reservations. And it's possible that the landlord, Raymond, is an innocent bystander, too. Like, I don't know him. I don't know enough about him. Yes, there are some suspicious things. There's some, you know, rumors going around. But if he's an innocent person who just rented to the wrong family, like, I don't want to be responsible for, like, throwing his name out there. And there's going to be a lot of people. Remember the case we did recently? 
about Noel uh, Rodriguez Alvarez, who is missing and his mother hasn't reported him missing. And um, I I talked some shit about their landlord, landlord, I guess. Like, even though he wasn't a landlord, he was like living in the house and they were living in like a shed behind the house. And what was his name? Charles or something like that. Yeah, I did. I did talk some shit about Charles, if that's his name. Um, but there's reason for that, right? Because you, Charles, put yourself out there. You gave interviews. You defended um, this this woman who clearly is guilty of something because her son's missing and she hasn't reported him missing. So you defended her and you interjected yourself. Therefore, you made yourself a target. But this guy, Raymond, uh, the landlord for McFadden, he has not done that. He has not come out. He hasn't said, oh, Jesse McFadden was a good person. Leave him alone. This is You're just not seeing this properly, things like that. He hasn't made himself a public figure at all. So I'm not going to pull him into the spotlight. If and when more information comes out that more strongly points to suspicious or malicious behavior on Holly or Raymond's parts, I will update, as I'm sure will be necessary anyways, because no doubt more information will be coming out about this case in general. Um, I have a feeling that we've barely even begun to scratch the surface. But before we leave each other today, I want to talk about the five children whose lives were brutally and abruptly cut short because they deserve to be remembered. 15-year-old Brittany Brewer was outgoing with a bubbly personality. Brittany loved kids. She had two little sisters who she was very close to. And one day she wanted to be a teacher or a veterinarian. She was known to be a friend to everybody. She was active in her church. She was always willing to help out with fundraising as well as willing to help out at home without ever having to be asked. And she was a hard worker and motivated with a lot going on in her life. Brittany was a member of the school choir. She was on the honor roll. And she'd recently been selected to represent her town as Miss Henrietta at the National American Miss Pageant in Tulsa. Even with all of that, she still found time to help her father with his parking lot maintenance business by writing emails and filling out invoices. Her father, Nathan Brewer, said, quote, she would have gave the shirt off her back for anybody. She was my sidekick. She was always there. End quote. Ivy Webster had just turned 14, I think a week before her murder, and she'd celebrated her birthday with a Hawaiian-themed birthday party. Her parents said she was a genuine person, outgoing, funny, beautiful. Everything that I would want to be, said her mother, Ashley, and everything that you would want your daughter to be, according to her father, Justin. Ivy loved to play softball. She loved all animals, especially her dog, Mavis. And her mother, Ashley, shared one of her favorite memories of Ivy from when Ivy was younger, saying, quote, our dog at the time was trying to eat a bee, and my daughter cared to save the bee, and it stung her when she was trying to save it. I had explained to her that it's a bee. They sting, you know? She was just so sad because she was trying to save it. It shows that she just wanted to be friendly to everything, end quote. Justin also had his own stories from happier times to share, saying, quote, There's so many good memories with that girl that it's sad. I mean, just like the other weekend, we were hanging up towel racks in the bathroom, and I was teaching her how to hang stuff up on the wall, and we were goofing around. And she took a picture of the moment, and that was awesome, end quote. I sadly don't know as much about Holly's children, Riley, Michael, and Tiffany, because I do feel that there is uh, some bias against Holly on the internet and maybe even in, in the mainstream media, and there's just not been as much about those three kids out there, which makes me very sad because they deserve to be remembered and talked about just as much as Ivy and Brittany. And I did my best looking for information, but I can confidently say my best was not good enough. And I wish I knew more about these three people, these three kids, because from their pictures, they look like really beautiful, special individuals who truly glowed from within, just like intelligent, outgoing, kind people. Like I can just, I look at them and it's just so sad. They're just gorgeous young people who have their whole lives ahead of them. And I don't know enough about them to even fully paint a picture for you. And it, it breaks my heart, honestly. But 17-year-old Riley Elizabeth Allen was the artistic one. She had a talent with a paintbrush. And one day she wanted to be a painter or a doctor so she could help people. 15-year-old Michael Mayo played football and track. He was apparently very athletic, very outgoing. 13-year-old Tiffany Guess was also athletic. She also ran track. She was in the seventh grade where she sang in the choir and had just tried out for the cheerleading team. She was smart and intuitive, very, very sweet and loving. And apparently her nickname was Tiffasaurus because she just was a very sweet and kind person and to the point where she didn't even really get angry. But if she did, like, get angry at you, she would growl at you like a dinosaur, like cutely. I wish I knew more about them, but I don't. I did reach out to Janine Mayo, who was Holly's mother and grandmother to these three kids, but she has not responded, which I totally get. Because from what I understand, she and her daughter have been getting a lot of hate online. Janine and the Mayo family have said that Holly is being painted as a villain on social media, and it's not just painful, but wrong. And Janine Mayo posted a statement on Facebook on May 2nd, which said, quote, All the posts on Facebook and the news talk about seven bodies found and mention Ivy and Brittany, but no mention of the other four found. 
Those other four were my daughter, Holly Guess, and her children, Riley Elizabeth Allen, Michael James Mayo, and Tiffany Dorr Guess. My heart goes out to Ivy's and Brittany's families, but they were not his only victims. My daughter loved her children, and yes, she married the man who killed them, but she was fooled by his charm. I hurt, just like the other families. But he took my world from me, my grandchildren and my daughter. I have a hole in my heart that he created by his actions. Jesse McFadden was a monster for his actions. I loved Ivy. She was a sweet girl. I really didn't know Brittany, but she must have been a sweet girl for my Tiffany to care for her. My prayers are there for both of the other families. I just ask that people remember my family as well and that they had names too, end quote. And completely fair to say, completely fair to feel, completely valid. According to Janine Mayo, the family never liked or trusted McFadden, and they hadn't approved of the relationship between him and Holly, but he had been able to manipulate and deceive Holly with stories explaining away his past crimes. He alienated Holly from her family, he moved her two and a half hours away, and he drove a wedge between Holly and her loved ones, who had previously been very close. Janine Mayo said, quote, She believed everything he said to the point where she didn't trust any of us. We didn't get to see the children hardly at all, end quote. Now, at this point, Ivy Webster's family have started a petition on change.org to help change the law on sentencing and probation terms for sex offenders, specifically child sex offenders. And the petition states, quote, It is our very strong belief that sex offenders cannot be rehabilitated. Did you know that when a child is sexually abused, they are traumatized and affected with several issues their entire life? Not just PTSD, but panic attacks, paranoia, also actual permanent nerve damage as well. It is a real dilemma. So if a person can sexually assault a child of any age and they have real lifelong trauma from that, isn't it fair that the offender be sentenced to life in prison without parole? We absolutely think so. So do I. If they have the nerve to ruin a child's chance at a normal life, they deserve no second chances. Agreed. Majority of sex crimes against children go unreported because the children and parents have to go through way too much to put that offender away from maximum 20 years. That's true. Their probation terms are also too relaxed. Why does a person who commits a sex crime against a child not require to have home checks done monthly? True. Why? Why? You know, very good question. Why are they allowed to marry people with children or even have their own children? This week in Henrietta, Oklahoma, five children and one woman were murdered due to a child sex offender being released and marrying a woman with children. Why was this allowed? Why did this not raise concerns with local law enforcement who knew he was a registered sex offender living with children? We cannot answer these questions, but we will say since COVID, probation officers have not been doing home visits with offenders. It's absurd how our judicial system has used COVID to not do their jobs. It's time for a change. Child sex offenders deserve way worse than anything they will get for their offenses. Agreed. Agreed. So you can actually sign this petition, but they are asking that only people who live in Oklahoma, who are Oklahoma residents, sign it because according to the authorities, those are the only signatures that will count, which I only discovered after I signed it. Now, do you think you could sign it? And then it would just look better that all of these people from around the nation, from around the world are paying attention and are angry about this? I don't know. I think only Oklahoma residents should sign it just so it doesn't muddy the waters and make it harder to count them. But either way, if you live in Oklahoma, you 100 million percent should sign this. And if you don't, you should share it with people who on all your social media, with people that you know who live in Oklahoma. Just put it out there. People who aren't watching this video or who don't know about this case can, you know, access the petition and sign it. But that is where we stand right now. Thank you all so much for being here. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, share it if you think it's worth sharing, subscribe if you haven't already. Let me know in the comment section what you think about this case. Am I too upset? Am I going too hard on law enforcement? Let me know what you think in the comment section. I'm very upset about this case. And like I said, if there's any updates, we will talk about them. But yeah, let me know what you think about it in the comment section. Let me know. And until next time, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. I'll see you very, very soon. So you got to let it go I got blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings Being played so my face don't be Got blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings Blood, blood on the strings Blood, no, it's been a rough week Channeling my song